Good morning, everyone. Hey, I'm here in uh, the Temple of Hathor in Upper Egypt. Um, the architecture should remind or should uh, maybe inspire us to think about what's going on in our story, because in our story, we're going to go to the Golden Palace. Um, so this is part three. Part three, the palace. So we're finally getting to where Hatshepsut the Pharaoh resides and also where um, Thutmose, her younger half-brother is also living um and he's kind of uh kind of like a prisoner in his own in his own section of the palace all right so this is chapter seven a royal summons and then we're also going to read uh chapter eight uh as well so chapter eight is called her majesty the pharaoh okay so we're going to meet Hatshepsut today i think so that'll be kind of interesting all right, so we now know that uh, Mara is a double spy. She works for the mysterious stranger and she works for uh, Sheftu. Sheftu wants her to be a message to uh, a messenger to send and receive messages to and from him to Thutmose. And the mysterious stranger wants her to catch the messenger. So she is the messenger she's supposed to catch. All right, now she's decided she's gonna turn over Sheftu's name to the mysterious stranger and Sheftu will be probably tortured and killed if she does that. All right, let's see what happens. And she's now also as the interpreter for Inani, the princess from Canaan, who is supposed to marry Thutmose, but he will not marry her. All right, chapter seven, this is part three of the palace, chapter seven, the royal summons. The princess Inani was in a sad state. After an entire Egyptian week, 10 days in the Golden House, she was still unable to conquer the awe and terror her new home inspired in her. She awoke calling nervously for Mara at the entrance of the first long-eyed Egyptian servant in the morning. And each evening had to be coaxed into the, gray, into the golden beast-headed couch that was her bed. The creature's pink ivory tongue and gleaming teeth terrified her. She could not, could not get comfortable on the exquisitely carved ebony headrest, which was so much cooler than her hot Syrian pillow. And in between waking and sleeping, there were for further ordeals, the cold bath twice daily, senseless torture which Egyptians accepted as a matter of course. The vigorous massaging afterward, the forcing of combs through her tangled hip-length hair, her vain attempts to master the art of eating with a spoon instead of the fingers. On top of all this, she had not yet so much as laid eyes on the queen or on the young king she had traveled so far to marry. Her pride was outraged. She was in tears half a dozen times a day, at this cavalier treatment. Yet the magnificence of the palace so overawed her that she hardly dared touch the furnishings of her own apartments. Mara really felt sorry for her. She herself was drinking in the luxury as parched ground drinks the waters of the Nile. As Inani's clo uh, closest companion, for the princess clung to her desperately as the one person who could and would explain away some of the countless bewilderments. She had actually been given a slave of her own to bathe and dress her. She dined magnificently off roasted waterfowl and incredible pastries. She had shady gardens to walk in and fresh flowers for her hair and neck as many times a day as she desired. True, she still kicked off those bothersome sandals whenever she had a chance and had to keep sharp watch over her tongue, lest it slip into the vocabulary of the streets. Remember, she is, she's a slave from the streets, and that's kind of the way she talks sometimes, so she has to always be mindful to speak like an aristocrat, meaning a, a noble, upper class. One highly colored phrase would give her away instantly to the palace servants, most of whom were free born and as far above her in station as she pretended to be above them. All these palace servants are way above her because she's just an ordinary slave, right? And so these palace uh, servants are all free of uh, people and way above her, but she's pretending to be above them. 
Secretly, she was a little in awe of them. It took self-control not to show it. It took gall to send them fetching and carrying as if she were some great lady. But Gaul Mara had in plenty, and Anani's helpless confusion was not hers. She had been a slave in luxurious houses, as Inani had not. Only the, say, the scale of this grandeur and her own changed role were new to her. Also, she was a natural mimic, blessed with a sense of humor and a cool nerve, which Inani certainly was not. And her uh, precarious life had made her as adaptable as a chameleon. How often had she stood ready with comb or fresh linen beside Zosh's lady's dressing table? Now she was the one who snapped her fingers for others to obey, and she had not forgotten a single haughty gesture. She took mischievous delight in using them all. Moreover, she had not yet caught a glimpse of her new master or of Sheftu either. Therefore, nothing whatever was required of her save luxurious lounging. Life was so perfect, it was in danger of becoming monotonous. On the eleventh morning after their arrival, she was awakened, as usual, by Inani's frightened call. Smiling through her yawn, Mara slipped from her couch and hurried into the adjoining room. Come now, my princess, she soothed. It is only the maidservant to bring thy fruit and greet the day with thee. See how she's changed the way she talks? Cease thy cowering, or she will laugh about thee in the servant's hall. And Ani reluctantly loosed her grasp of the bedclothes and sat up, still eyeing the maid with distrust. She looked sideways at me, down her nose, as if she were the queen herself, she complained. Nonsense! Her father was likely a stone cutter, or at best a groom in the royal stables. Wh what would thy brother say? Mara turned to the servant, who had set down her bowl of fruit, and waited now for dismissal. It was true that her painted eyes held an insolent gleam. Any Egyptian felt superior to a barbarian. Why are your hands at your sides? inquired Mara coldly. The servant's eyes met hers and lost their mockery. Hastily, her right hand went to her left shoulder. Better? It is possible I will not mention your miserable name to Hatshepsut the Glorious, provided you show proper deference to your princess after this. That's Mara speaking to the servant girl. Excellency, live forever, gasped the girl, turning white. You would not. I, I never meant. Dismissed, Mara cut her off. The servant prostrated herself and then fled. Mara was inwardly convulsed. Oh, how marvelously done, she thought. Did ever a slave so beautifully subdue a free maid? Remember, Mara's the slave, the servant is the free maid. How she would rage if she knew who it is that plays the great lady. She turned back to find Inani regarding her with both gratitude and admiration. Mara, what did you say to her? Only that you are the Princess Inani and must be treated so. Do not think of her. She is a, as a beetle under your sandal. Come, perfume your mouth with the figs and grapes she has brought you. It will soon be time for the bath. Inani's face fell dismally at the prospect, but she climbed down from her high couch, being careful to stay well away from the gleaming teeth of the beasts who supported it. A few minutes later, she was hungrily eating a fig and mourning the skimpiness, mourning meaning like sadly, um, being sad, the, of the skimpiness of the Egyptian breakfasts. Why, in my homeland, we have bread and good meat. Here you do not even dignify it by the name of breakfast, but call it the perfuming of the mouth. We do not think of it as a meal, said Mara, smiling. Lift up your head, Rose of Canaan. Perhaps your summons from Pharaoh will come today. It should have come before. Have they forgotten they sent for me? Nay, of course not. No doubt Her Majesty is allowing you time to recover from your journey. Now, do not brood about it. We will do something different this morning. My little slave tells me there are gardens we have not yet visited. Also, that there is a pavilion on the roof 
from which she stopped. The tapestry curtaining the doorway into her own bedchamber had stirred noticeably, and there was no draft. From which one can see the entire city, she finished evenly. She put down a bunch of grapes untasted. Meanwhile, with your highness's leave, I will retire to bathe and dress. Summoning two of the Syrian women to divert the princess, she walked to the curtain doorway and with a sudden motion pushed, it aside, pushed aside the hangings. The room was as empty as when she had left it. This is Mara returning to her own room. She stepped inside, letting the tapestry fall behind her. The bedclothes were still in a snarl on the lion-legged couch. The chest and littered dressing table stood undisturbed against the wall, bright with painted golden butterflies. The doors to both bath chamber and hall were closed and blank. Yet those hangings had moved, like when someone walks through something or opens another door. She flung off her night robe, wondering why it had not occurred to her before that a spy might have been set to keep a watch on her. Sheftu had openly admitted that he trusted her no farther than tomorrow, and that for that stony-eyed master of hers? She frowned, realized she had been rapidly putting on her own clothes, asked, what? what was she, was she trying to reveal herself for what she was? Just as rapidly, she stripped the garments off, put on her night robe again, and clapped her hands for her slave. The little brown maid, uh, maiden flung open the hall door so promptly that Mara gave her a sharp look. Was, this, was she the spy then? No, surely not. The child was no more than 12 years old, with a face as innocent as a flower. Mara pitied her suddenly, remembering how it felt at 12 to stand motionless for hours in some corridor, waiting for the clap of hands. Hast been impatient, little Nessie. Go then, make ready my bath. We'll soon be done here. When the, sl when the girl had disappeared into the bath chamber, Mara glanced around once more, uneasily searching for some clue to her uninvited visitor. On a, sud on a sudden thought, she went to the little carved chest and raised its lid. At first, she saw nothing amiss. Then she dropped to her knees, lifting with cautious fingers a fold of the topmost garment. Under it lay a common honey cake, the sort sold in the streets of Menfi by the baker's boys, a honey cake like she stole. So who saw her steal those honey cakes? Chef Du saw that and so did the mysterious stranger. She picked it up frowning. It had not been there before. Of that, she was certain. She turned it over, scanned it top and bottom, and finally broke it open. There, in its flaky middle, was a scrap of papyrus. In a trice, she was reading the tiny hieroglyphs. So it's kind of like a fortune cookie. Inside this honey cake was like a little paper, a little piece of papyrus. A princess enjoys the lotus garden in the cool of the evening. That was all it said. Thoughtfully, Mara tore it up into a dozen pieces and after some hesitation, dropped the scraps into a tall alabaster vase that stood in one corner. Even if they were pieced together, they would seem but a fragment of some scribe's copybook. She ate the honey cake, dusted the crumbs from her fingers and went to take her bath. Very cleverly done, she thought, as she lay on the rubbing table, enjoying the menstruations of the capable little Nessie. So there was no spy, only a summons to walk this evening with the Princess Inani in one of the palace gardens, one with a lotus pool. Perhaps she could locate it from the roof pavilion Nessie had mentioned. But which master had sent the summons? It would be like Chef to, to identify himself with the honey cake. He had seen her stealing cakes that day in Memphis still. So had the stone-faced one. She remembered his acid remark. Remember, I am no stupid baker's apprentice. Should the chain and you disappear somehow between here and the wharves, it would be regrettable. That's what, he, that's what this uh, stony-faced mysterious stranger said to her. Well, she had not made off with his golden chain, nor had she deceived him in any way. On the contrary, he would have good reason to be pleased with her when they met again. 
There was no need to be afraid of him, none at all. She had the information he wanted, more than he'd ever hoped to get. Mara found she was no longer enjoying her massage. Rising abruptly, she led the way back to the bedroom. Should it be not Sheftu, but her master awaiting her in the Lotus Garden tonight? Her stay at the palace would be over almost before it began, and that would be regrettable too, especially for Sheftu. Remember, if she meets, if it's the stony-faced master or the mysterious stranger, same guy, if, if it's him that she needs to go meet, if he sent this message, then she's pretty much done, and Sheftu is going to be killed. She gets to get freedom and some gold, and she gets to leave. But now she's thinking, I don't want to leave yet. I'm kind of enjoying hanging out in the palace. And she doesn't like the idea of having Sheftu get killed. One mention of the cooling north breeze to be found on the roof was enough to arouse Anani's enthusiasm for a visit there. At mid-morning, she and Mara, accompanied only by little Nessie, made their way through a maze of halls, up an outside stairway, and out onto the terrace lawn here. It was cool and windy, strewn with soft couches and shaded by a great canopy set on uh, beribboned columns. Here and there rose wide-mouthed air scoops, which sent the breeze down into the sleeping chambers below. So they had kind of like a neat um, air conditioning system with these scoops that sent cooler air into where people slept. Mara walked in, uh, to the balustrade and leaned forward upon her elbows. From here, two stories up, one had a wide view of the sunlit labyrinth of courtyards, passages, groves, and gardens enclosed by the palace walls. Her strolls with Anani had showed her only a fraction of them. Look, my princess, she exclaimed, your new home. Anani looked, trembled, and moved uneasily away. Mara watched her for a moment, half pitying, half contemptuous, then turned back to the balustrade. Which garden? There were so many. She made a slow circuit of the roof, almost dismayed at the expanse of the palace grounds and their complexity. Save for the huge guardroom, the entire ground floor of the Golden House was devoted to workshops, kitchens, and storerooms. Uh, uh, among and beyond these were walled gardens and in bewildering profusion, meaning so many. And every one of them had its lotus pool. But as she rounded the corner to the north side, she saw what she wanted. It was the largest garden of all with a pool, the very shape of a lotus bud, almost flowering with the blue lilies and more of them painted along its rim satisfied. She, so she realized that's the garden I'm supposed to go to meet whoever it was that sent me that message in the honey cake. Satisfied, she was about to turn away when she chanced to raise her eyes beyond the walls. Ah, blessed Osiris, she breathed. Highness, come to the side if you would see Thebes. There it lies. Thebes is the city. Inani joined her at the balustrade, and together they looked out over the vast spread of the city. The palace stood near the Nile's west bank, within view of the queen's magnificent temple, which stood low, colonnaded, and gleaming white in the dazzling sunlight, far back against the golden cliffs. Mara could see the green incense, terra incense terraces Nakonk had helped bring into being, from them, the desert descended in two broad benches to the level of the valley. Then uh, the necropolis, a belt of low dust-colored buildings, housing the embalmers. Those are the ones who cut up the bodies. If someone's dead, they cut up the, you know, and prepare for mummification. They cut, take out the internal organs and all that. Coffin makers, stone cutters, glass blowers, weavers, and all other craftsmen whose work was devoted to the tombs, stretched on to join the emerald fields of the flower growers, which in turn extended to the river. The river divided the city like a silver blade and was dotted with every size and shape of vessel. We're talking about boats. Behind the slow-moving sails rose the high east bank of Thebes, proper 
a maze of white buildings flooded with sun from whose flagstaffs and massive temples uh, pylons red and white banners wave like beckoning fingers. Every surface sparkled with color and the glint of gold. Roofs stretched eastward under the brilliant blue sky as far as the eye could reach. Mara propped her chin on her hands, drinking it all in a marvelous city, grander than Menfi, gayer than Abydos, and even wickeder, it was said, than Bubastis on the lower Nile. It filled her with excitement. Around the palace itself, a small town had grown up, composed largely of the white-walled villas of Egypt's great nobles and a few of the finest craftsmen and goldsmiths' studios, Mara stared at the chariots flashing along the stone-paved streets, at the palms thrusting up like plumes from invisible pleasure gardens, and wondered if one of those grand houses belonged to Lord Sheftu. Remember, she knows Lord Sheftu is super, super, super rich. Ay, what a life they lead, those great ones. Think, my princess. You are one of them now and live in the center of the world. Is it not a glorious city you have come to after all your journey? I hate it, whispered Anani. Startled, Mara swung around. Anani was gripping the balustrade, her plump face white with misery. Her eyes swerved away from Mara's astonished ones, as though she were frightened to have spoken her mind for once. But she went on recklessly. It's too big. It's too full of buildings. In my homeland, there are plains and green pastures, and the tents of the shepherds shine in the sun, and the flocks graze about all about us. It is not like this in any way. All speak my language there, but here all are strangers to me, and know not my ways, and I know not theirs. What does it matter? Think you are to be the bride of royalty of a prince of Egypt. The king has not sent for me, but he will. Mara could not help laughing a little. Meanwhile, have you not all you could desire? Slaves and comforts and a home in the golden house itself? Take heart. It is not possible you could be homesick. Is it not? Anani turned, gathering the folds of her heavy shawl, and made an effort to smile. She had never looked gawkier or more defenseless, but suddenly she was not funny at all. I suppose it is not. You have been good to me, Mara, and speak to me in my own tongue, and explain things, and try to teach me to be Egyptian, but I fear I am no credit to you. I cannot help longing for the plains of Syria and the voices of my brothers. She broke off, tears welling into her eyes, then moved abruptly to the other side of the pavilion. Mara turned away to, no longer amused at a ridiculous barbarian, but sorry for a homesick maid with all her heart. You'll find that uh, Inani is one of the better characters in this book. She is um, full of... She's full of humility and love and kindness. Um, and, and you'll find out more about her as we go, but she's one of my favorite characters. Suddenly above the voices of the doves in the palace eaves and the faint melodious creaking of water wheels in the fields, there came a new sound, far, high, piercing. Mara looked up. There above her in the brilliant vault of the sky, a great bird soared, Horus, the falcon, the god, the symbol of royalty. As she watched, it closed its powerful wings and dropped like a plummet upon a desert lark, just spiraling upward from the meadows. The lark's melody was choked off in mid-trill. Again, the great wings beat and the falcon wheeled off toward Libya. Its triumphant scream, seven notes on a descending scale, trailed off after it like a banner. So that she, Mara just watched this falcon dive down and grab a, a desert lark and, and kill it so it can eat it later. Mara was still breathless from the beauty and cruelty of its attack when an exclamation from Anani made her whirl around. A chamberlain had emerged from the door to the stair to the stairway. 
He advanced to Anani with measured tread and bowed stiffly. Princess, rejoice, the glorious one, daughter of Ra, most high, Horus of gold and great god of the land of Do the double kingdom, commands your presence. Mara, quavered the princess, taking an uncertain step backward. But Mara was already hurrying to her side. Quick, highness, send little Nessie to summon your women. We must go down at once. It is the audience with the queen. So we're going to finally meet Queen Hatshepsut. We will do that right now. Chapter eight, let's keep going. Hang in there. We're going to get done in just a minute. It's very short, this chapter. Her Majesty the Pharaoh. A sudden hush fell upon the crowd in the huge colonnaded guardroom, and all heads turned in one direction. Courtiers, priests, glittering ladies, and grouchy ambassadors fell back silently to make room for the procession which had entered from the courtyard at the far end of the hall. The chamberlain, tapping his long, beribboned wand, paced first. Inani followed him, with Mara close by her side and the twelve Syrians at her heels. Slowly they moved down the long aisle of watching faces, past all the supercilious painted eyes and quirking lips, past the arched brows, the murmurs behind hands, the disdainful shrugs, down the whole shining length of the room. What's happening there is all the, 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 the nobility, all the powerful people, all the, all the uh, great people, as they say, the wealthy, they're watching Anani come in and they're all laughing. They're, going, they're, they're laughing at her and kind of making fun of, of her behind her back. And, it's, and she knows that's what's happening. And it's pretty, pretty awful for her. In fact, it says this. It was the worst ordeal Inani had had to face, and this one she met like a princess. Mara, close beside her, could feel the plump arm quaking under its gaudy, thick draperies, but Inani held her chin high and kept her eyes unwaveringly on the back of the chamberlain's neck. Perhaps she was thinking of her brothers. There was an antechamber to pass through before they stood in front of the tall bronze doors. Here, the chamberlain faced them and rattled off a list of instructions concerning court etiquette, meaning how to behave when you're in front of the pharaoh, at which Mara translated only the least confusing. Then at last, the door swung open. The chamberlain stepped forward and flung himself on his face, intoning, Behold, the majesty of the black land, Horus of gold, enduring of kingship, splendid of diadems, Ruler of Lower and Upper Egypt, enduring of form is Ra, Merkur, Hapshetsut. May the god live forever. Mara, suddenly trim, uh, trembling from head to foot, advanced beside Anani until they stood inside the room. There, across a stretch of gleaming pavement, stood a raised dais framed by two exquisitely painted columns. Upon the dais rested a great throne fashioned entirely of shimmering electrum, and on the throne sat a woman so coldly beautiful that it took away the breath to gaze on her. She sat stiffly, her glittering dark eyes fixed, her hands holding emblems shining with gold and enamel, fluted linen, fine as a cobweb, enveloped her like mist. She was weighted with jewels. Upon her flawlessly molded chin was tied the narrow ceremonial beard denoting kingship. And upon her head rested the heavy red and white double crown of the two kingdoms, with the golden cobra curving out over her brow. Woman or not, there sat the awesome majesty of Egypt, the sun god incarnate. The entire procession fell to its knees. Fourteen foreheads, Mara's among them, touched the cold tiles of the floor. Lift up your head, princess of Syria, said Hatshepsut. You may approach my majesty. Her voice was high and metallic. Mara felt the glittering eyes upon her even before she raised her own. With an effort to meet them, Pharaoh had not relaxed her godlike rigidity, but she had turned her head, and her scrutiny was so thorough, so impersonal, so impersonal, it made Mara feel like a bird on a spit 
meaning like a bird that's being cooked. You may speak, interpreter, added the queen impatiently. Mara tried and failed. In a panic, she swallowed, tried again, and this time managed to inform Inani that she was to rise and walk forward. Mara, who's usually so cool and so tough, is falling apart here. She, she's forgetting how to talk and forgetting what to do. And she's going to you know, get herself together here. What shall I say, Mara? came the princess's frightened whisper as she reluctantly obeyed. Say it for me, please. May, Ma May Hatshepsut the Glorious endure forever, stammered Mara. The princess Inani presents her respects to your radiance. The queen permitted herself a coldly gracious smile. Then to Mara's infinite relief, the probing eyes were withdrawn from her, and Hatshepsut turned her entire attention to Inani. There followed conventional questions as to her comfort, congratulations on the successful voyage, assurances that she need only speak to have anything she desired. Mara was breathing more easily now. The nervous sweat had dried on the palms of her hands, and she had regained the use of her tongue. As she translated the stilted phrases, she began to be aware of other people in the room. They were standing all about the walls, motionless as shadows, but here and there, the twinkle of gold as a head turned or the flash of jewels from a lifted hand gave proof that they were people and not painted images. And have you had audience with His Highness, your bridegroom? inquired Hatshepsut. Scarcely waiting for Inani's almost inaudible reply, she spoke with a malicious smile to someone standing to her right and slightly behind her on the dais itself. What think you, Count Sen? Is she not all we expected and even more? So that is Count Senmut, thought Mara. Curiously and with awe, she studied the most powerful figure in Egypt, a spare, big-shouldered man wearing a twist of amulets about his throat. The queen seemed ageless, but Senmut's darkly handsome face mirrored all the struggle and scheming of her 18 years upon the throne. His smile, faint though it was, carved harsh furrows from his flaring nostrils to the corners of his mouth. His eyes were rapacious. He bent to murmur something to the queen, uh, and she laughed. I, it will be a sight, a pity she will not enjoy it. Interpreter, inform the princess that she may expect to meet her bridegroom very soon. So they're talking about how uh, Inani's not going to enjoy meeting Thutmose, because Thutmose is going to reject her. And, they're ha and Queen Hatshepsut and Sinmut are happy that Inani's kind of plump, and not very attractive and kind of homely and, you know, kind of a barbarian, as they think. As Mara obeyed, Hatshepsut lifted a slim hand loaded with rings and beckoned lazily to someone who stood half hidden in the shadows beside the throne. Next instant, instant every word of Babylonian she knew fled from Mara's mind. It was Sheftu who stepped forward with his leopard's grace, but a far, far different Sheftu from the man who had lounged beside her while the sail slapped and the sun sparkled on the river. This one wore royal linen as casually as the other had worn his simple shenty. His dark features were arrogant against a headcloth of woven gold. There was gold on his ankles, his arms, and his long sinewy fingers, and a blaze of emeralds at his throat. Here was the great noble she had tried and failed to picture, a lord of creation as remote from her as Pharaoh herself. Only the amulet on his left wrist was unchanged and its curiously knotted flax threads and familiar beads gave her a feeling akin to homesickness. For he who wore it seemed a stranger. Remember the, the one amulet he wore that she read about the crocodiles? Then for just an instant, his eyes met hers, and a delicious warmth stole over her. It, I, I was wrong, she thought. This is the same who once held me in his arms, though he would not kiss me. The very same, by the beard of Ta, whose grand rich life I hold in the palm of my gutter snipe's hand this minute. 
Send word to Thutmose today, Hatshepsut was murmuring, that he must receive this Syrian at once. You, yourself, Lord Sheftu, arrange for the marriage as soon as may be, and we will have done with her. How stupid and vulgar she is in her tasteless wrappings. A fit consort for my surly half-brother, think you not. Hi, how I would like to see that meeting. He will grow red in the face and hurl vases and ornaments on, uh, to the floor and pace up and down in his endless pacings, as he always does. Hatshepsut smiled. Nevertheless, he will obey me, as he always does. In her venom emerged, uh, uh, if her venom enraged Sheftu, he gave no hint of it. His expression was as smoothly controlled as his bow, no more than an inclination of the head required for his exalted rank, and he bent not a hair lower. Pharaoh's name is glorious, he remarked amiably, without specifying, Mara noticed, whether it was Hatshepsut or Thutmose to whom he gave the title. All shall be as Pharaoh desires. He could be saying it, not Pharaoh the Hatshepsut, but he could be talking about what he thinks should be the Pharaoh, which is Thutmose. You are ever trustworthy, Lord Sheftu. Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut smiled on him, and he smiled winsomely back. And now, my lord, if you will provide our fat princess with refreshment, he made a careless gesture at once. Lackeys bearing sweetmeats and garland jars of wine converged on Inani, then passed through the ranks of the courtiers, who obediently came to life, clinking their wine cups with the rigidity correct, with rigidly correct stilted movements, which made court etiquette a sort of elegant ballet. Chef Tu turned away and walked almost sauntered back to his place, arrogant and assured, not for him the puppet-like movements of these lesser beings. Mara, still on her knees behind the princess, watched him and admired his daring. Suddenly, her eyes riveted on a half-shadowed figure just beyond him. For the second time, she felt the shock of a familiar face, but this time the sensation was distinctly unpleasant. For there, grim-faced as the devourer himself, stood her mysterious new master. So right behind Sheftu was this new master. She sees both Sheftu and the mysterious new master. For a moment, the man's cold visage, his face, his look, held her fascinated. Did he ever change expression? Just so he had looked when he offered her riches and danger back in Menfi. Just so he would still look while he watched the slow death of that gold-decked young renegade beside him. How would they kill Sheftu once they knew? He could not hope for the mercy of the strangler, not while Hatshepsut and her wily architect ruled the black land. He would more likely meet a, the torturer's state, or perhaps Mara had a feeling this would please Count Senmu. Perhaps they would bow to Sheftu's ultimate destiny and feed him to the crocodiles. Those long, sinister brown-green shapes from, with their pale mouths wide open, waiting just one word from her. I cannot do it, was her first thought. But her second was, I, you can do it, since you must. But there was, uh, but was there any need for haste? The thought calmed her. It would be pleasant to stay at the Golden House a little longer, she told herself. I will not speak quite yet. Later, I, to, uh, so be it, but not yet. So she's deciding not to tell the, um, the mysterious stranger about Chef Du just yet. She wants to enjoy hanging out and, you know, living a life of royalty. At that, a new fear struck her. If she delayed, who knew how the cat might jump? It was possible had Shepsu had met her match in this clever chef too. Given a little time, he might bring his plans to maturity and snatch that gleaming throne and give it to his king. Aye, then what would happen to the queen's favorites and their gold and the dreams of the princess Inani's interpreter? Mara knew only too well. Her only sure safety lay in serving her master. But as she looked from him to the indolently lounging Lord Sheftu, it was hard to choose. 
The solution that sprang into her mind next instant was so simple, so obvious, that she all but laughed aloud. She would not choose. Why make a choice between these two when each thought her his ally, his bonded slave? Why not play both ends against the middle? Serve both, meanwhile, serving only herself. Then when the cat jumped, it's just figurative, like when whoever won this, this struggle. Meanwhile, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, then when the cat jumped, she would jump with it. I the opportunities that opened for one who knew how to use her wits. She started at the sound of the queen's voice. Dismiss the lackeys, Count Senmut. I think this Syrian does not like our wine. The servants withdrew and had Shepsut spoke again, this time tomorrow. Bid the, friend, the, <laughs> bid the princess farewell. May the gods of Egypt and Syria go with her and offer her my majesty's felicitations on her coming marriage, which will surely be a joyous one. The voice dripped mockery, and the beautiful lips twisted into a smile remarkably like uh, the one carved, carving furrows on the dark countenance of Count Senmut behind her. Mara felt her optimism drain away in spite of all she could do, and the sight of the white mask which was in Ani's face lowered her spirit still further. Friendless, homesick, unfortunate princess, small wonder she had been able to swallow the wine. And Ani managed to stammer out her thanks and farewells, and Mara translated with an effort. Hatshepsut nodded, and her smile grew broader. She began to laugh deep in her throat. The sound grew in volume until the chamber was filled with it. Mara, see, they're laughing at the situation. They're laughing at Inani. Mara found herself remembering the scream of Horus, the royal falcon, as he plummeted down from the sky that morning to seize the lark. Her flesh was creeping as, uh, as she rose from her knees at last to back slowly toward the door beside the pallid Inani. For the queen, still laughing, had raised her gold and enameled scepter. The audience was over. All right, so we met the queen. She's pretty impressive. She is smart. She is beautiful. She is cruel. Um, and we will see more of this later. Okay, and, uh, and you understand uh, Mara's decision. Mara is going to pretend to serve both masters until she knows who's going to win. And then she's going to jump on their side. She doesn't want to be on the losing side here because she could be killed. All right. Well, guys, we'll read tomorrow. I uh, hope you have a great day. Until then, take care.